Hi, and welcome back to Storytime Science at the Exploratorium. Today's episode is Bubble Cells. That's going to mean a lot more once we get to the activity. But first, we're going to read a book. And today's book, one of my favorites, is Ada Twist, Scientist. So let's get started. Today's book is Ada Twist, Scientist by Andrea Beatty and David Roberts. This book isn't specifically about bubble cells, but this is a really good story about a very curious young woman. And uh, she's probably going to be a scientist when she grows up. She's kind of already a scientist. Ada Marie, Ada Marie said not a word till the day she turned three. She bounced in her crib and looked all around, observing the world, but not making a sound. She learned how to climb and made her big break with a trail of chaos left in her wake. She ran through the day, chasing each sound and sight, and didn't slow down till she conked out at night. There's a picture of her brother here, too. Her parents were frazzled, but tried not to freak as Ada grew bigger and still did not speak. Clearly, young Ada, with lots in her head, would have something to say when it ought to be said. That's just what happened when Ada turned three. She tore through the house on a fact finding spree and climbed up the clock just as high as she could. Her parents yelled, stop, as all good parents would. Ada's chin quivered, but she did not cry. She took a deep breath and she simply asked, why? Why does it tick and why does it talk? Why don't we call it a granddaughter clock? Why are there pointy things stuck to a rose? Why are there hairs up inside of your nose? She started with why. And then what, how, and when? By bedtime, she came back to why once again. She drifted to sleep as her dazed parents smiled at the curious thoughts of their curious child, who wanted to know what the world was about. They kissed her and whispered, you'll figure it out. Her parents kept up with their high-flying kid, whose questions and chaos both grew as she did. Oh, and there are all these things on this page. What is it for? Will it be the same? What if, why will it? When will it? When? What? What does it do? Why won't it? Why does it? How? How does it? Why? Even Miss Greer found her hands were quite full when young Ada's chaos wreaked havoc at school. But this much was clear about Miss Ada Twist. She had all the traits of a great scientist. Ada was busy that first day of spring, testing the sounds that make mockingbirds sing. When a horrible stench whacked her right in the nose, a pungent aroma that curled up her toes. Zowie, said Ada, which got her to thinking, what is the source of that terrible stinking? How does a nose know there's something to smell? And does it still stink if there's no nose to tell? She rattled off questions 
and tapped on her chin. She'd start at the start where she ought to begin. A mystery, a riddle, a puzzle, a quest. This was the moment that Ada loved best. Ada did research to learn all she could of smelling and smells, both the stinky and good. One hypothesis Ada thought could be true, the terrible stink came from dad's cabbage stew. She tested and tested, but soon Ada knew it was time to come up with hypothesis two. Then Zowie, the stink struck again, just like that. Hypothesis two, it's caused by the cat. The cat couldn't make such a stink on its own. It needed perfume and some fancy cologne. So young Ada tested. The test was a flop. She started again, but her parents yelled, stop. Look, she's trying to put the cat in the washing machine. Ada Marie, Ada Marie, to the thinking chair. Now, by the time we count three. Enough, said her mother. That's it, said her dad. Her parents were frustrated, frazzled, and mad. Why, Ada questioned. Her mother said, no. What, Ada queried. Her father said, go. You've ruined our supper. You've made the cat stink. Enough with your questions. Now sit there and think. She looked at her parents. Her heart turned to goo. Poor Ada Twist didn't know what to do. She sat all alone by herself in the hall, and Ada once more could say nothing at all. And so Ada sat, and she sat, and she sat, and she thought about science and stew and the cat and how her experiments made such a big mess. Does it have to be so? Is that part of success? Are messes a problem? And while she was thinking, what was the source of that terrible stinking? Ada Marie did what scientists do. She asked a small question, and then she asked two. And each of those led her to three questions more. And some of those questions resulted in four. As Ada got thinking, she really dug in. She scribbled her questions and tapped on her chin. She started at why? And then what, how, and when? At the end of the hall, she reached why once again. Her parents calmed down, and they came back to talk. They looked at the hallway and just had to gawk. No patch of bare paint could be seen on the wall. The thinking chair now was the great thinking hall. They watched their young daughter and sighed as they did. What would they do with this curious kid who wanted to know what the world was about? They smiled and whispered, we'll figure it out. And that's what they did, because that's what you do when your kid has a passion and heart that is true. They remade their world and now they're all in the act of helping young Ada sort fiction from fact. She asks lots of questions. How could she resist? It's all in the heart of a young scientist. And as for that smell, what can Ada Twist do? But learn all she can with her friends in grade two. Will they discover the stink that curls toes? Well, that is the question, and someday, who knows? Our bubble cell activity. That's kind of an interesting term. Let's check it out. 
first we're going to need our different materials. I have here some blue tempera paint mixed in with some soap, just the kind of soap that you use, the liquid soap that you use, say, if you're doing the dishes. And of course, you help out doing the dishes all the time. And here I have some red tempera paint mixed in with some soap and a little bit of water to thin it out. In order to make these, the recipe, and you can kind of futz with it a little bit, I use two or three of these two ounce little jars of tempera paint. So I had a couple of different colors of blue in the blue one and a couple of different colors of the red to make the red one. You could mix them up and make some sort of purplish eggplanty color. You can do, use whatever color you want, but you want it to be a dark color. And then you're also going to need a pie tin. If you're going to be using a pie tin that you will then want to bake pie in, you could line it with aluminum foil nice and tightly, but this paint is non-toxic and it's watercolor and it washes up real easily. So you could just go ahead and use a pie tin and then you need a straw, a paper straw, of course. And we're going to, and you need some paper. I have some construction paper in white and I have some regular paper, paper here also in white. And the first thing I'm going to do, and by the way, this is a little bit messy. You probably want to do this in your kitchen or the bathroom close to a sink you might spill a little, and as it, with many of your activities, it's really good to have a grown-up assistant. Grown-ups make the best assistants. So let's see, I'm gonna try it with the blue. And I'm going to pour some of this. Ooh, I have a nice bubble right at the top, which I'm gonna burst. Um, and I'm going to pour some into you can kind of see the thickness of it there. All right, so I poured some in and it might drip on the side a little bit. Eh, it's okay, watercolor, it's non-toxic. It'll clean up. And this is another reason that you might want to have a grown-up assistant. First of all, you want to make sure that you don't drink up the soap solution, the soap and paint solution because bleh, um, you want to make sure that you are always blowing, blowing through the straw, straw, not slurping anything up. You also, to avoid splatter, before you start blowing into the straw, you want to make sure it is well to the bottom of your pie pan. And in order to get this a little bit deeper, I am going to tilt the pie pan just a little bit. All right? So I'm going to tilt it like that. I'm going to make sure the straw is all the way in because I don't want any splatter. And I'm going to try blowing some bubbles. All right, I'm going to try to do this quickly. And let's start with the construction paper and set this down. It doesn't always work the first time. Oh, but it did the first time for me. All right, oh wow, actually, that's a pretty good one right there. So these are a print of that mound of bubbles. I'm gonna set it down here to dry. I did some extra ones at home too, although that one's darker, so that one looks better, the one I just did. Um, I did a blue one, and I did a red one, and I did some other red ones. I guess that extra day or two of letting the soap and the paint really mix together. And by the way, let me go back to the recipe for a second. Besides maybe four to six ounces of tempera paint, um, I maybe had a third of a cup, a quarter cup, or to a third of a cup of the dishwashing soap, and then I added some water to get this thickness. You kind of saw the thickness. It's not, it's not like water thin. It's, you know, just a little like soupy, kind of like, I don't know, butternut squash soup, maybe, that thickness. And that extra couple of days of just sitting there in the jar really let it blend together. So the reason that I call this a bubble cell activity is 
these bubble shapes, which are not all perfectly round, and they're not all the same size, and they all kind of meet up with each other. They share their little outside skins, their little outside areas. They look very, very much like real cells that you see in nature. Let me show you a picture of skin cells. These are skin cells that were dyed, so you can see them better. And you can see they're not all exactly the same shape. They're not all exactly the same size, but they all share this outside skin, which is called the cell membrane. Looks very, very close to what we just made. Also, these human skin cells have little dots that you see. That's the nucleus in each cell. Your bubble cells don't have a nucleus. That's sort of the center of the cell, like the heart and the soul and the brain of the cell. You could draw them into the bubble cell prints that you made. And uh, you can notice how they're not all the same size, they're not all the same shape, but they all share. Those cell membranes are kind of like packed in together, just like your bubble cell print. The other thing is, let's look at a picture of plant cells. Again, these were from a picture taken under a microscope. And you can see how the shapes are not all the same. They look really, really similar to your bubble cell shapes, but they all share that outside membrane or that cell wall. So it's kind of interesting to be able to do a model with bubble, bubble solution and paint and a little bit of water that models something that you find in nature. And maybe it'll lead you to doing some more research. Maybe you have books at home. Maybe you have somebody who's taken a biology class and you can talk to them. Or maybe you can even look up stuff on the internet. But I like this activity because it's pretty, but it also leads you to think more about something that occurs naturally. It's time for Poetry Corner. I couldn't find a really good poem about cells, so I wrote one myself. Let's see what you think. I have trillions of cells inside of me, and on the outside, too. My skin, my tongue, my heart, my lungs, my eyes, and blood, it's true. All animals and plants have cells, and all those cells have parts a membrane, mitochondria, a nucleus to start. Our cells, they know just what to do, because that is nature's plan. These tiny living cells all serve to make me who I am. 